Good evening, everybody, on our Razoom this evening, December the 1st, uh, a truly international gathering, I've already noted. And um, it's, it, it, it's good to have you all with us. And those of you joining us on the YouTube channel in the next, I don't know, 10 years, maybe, um, many hundreds of you, judging by past experience. That's all, um, that's all very good. Um, OK. Um, the, our next meeting will be in uh, January, January the 5th, and our, our pattern is slightly different in as much as on January the 5th, we have two section members sharing their endeavours. There's um, Andrew, um, Andrew Thornton and, um, and bear with me a second, Martin Burgess, um, and he'll be calling in from Germany a very interesting um, amateur scientist that we met at the Ukara conference in Germany. And he'll be talking about a uh, Cherikov radiation detector he's using for muon observations. And um, Andrew, Andrew Thornton has, is, is, is building an entire astrophysics lab at home and has made huge progress in a relatively short space of time. Um, largely, I have to say, from magnificent support he's had from our friends in the USA um, and, and indeed in this country. So Martin will be sharing his endeavours. And um, I'm hoping in the uh, going forward that the first half of the meeting will be a eminent academic who can share uh, current research and give us a bit of um, teaching and inspiration on what's happening at a very high level. Um, and then also in the second half, um, those of us beavering away on homemade instruments in our in our labs at home to share um, results, ask questions, resolve issues, etc. So um, if you would like a slot in the second half, do let me know um, and I can I can make it happen. Um, if there's any topic you would like me to um, find a academic for, then again, let me know. Um, we're putting the program together from the second quarter of next year now. Um, and that's probably enough of me waffling on. Um, if you have sufficient bandwidth and a camera, do leave your camera on. Um, it's, it's, um, it's kind of courteous to the speaker rather than him looking at, at uh, a, a matrix of blank squares uh, um, and also that means that you can't fall asleep without the speaker realizing that you're not paying full, of, paying full attention. Um, okay tonight I'm really pleased to um, say that we've got Professor Clive uh, Tadhunter with us from Sheffield University and he'll be answering that that question the future of the Milky Way looking at quasars black holes all the big all the big stuff and energetic stuff that we're all um, really very interested in. So Clive, um, no more waffling from me. I hand our monitors, our screens, our mobile phones and tablets over to you for the next hour or so. It's all yours. Oh, thank you. I'll just uh, scare, uh, share my screen here. Yes, should be possible. Uh... There's a green button at the bottom on zoom that says share screen and i've oh, enabled it at my yeah, end exactly. oh, you see that that looks like it's good yep okay i'll just get the presentation up as i say i'm yes. not sure how to see see much apart from the presentation when i put it on so you know if the signal goes just let me know yeah we can see your presentation and also yeah. um we can see you well I uh, can yeah see... I, can see down, I can see that yeah people down the side that's good yes. um, <laughs> All right, uh, here we go. Oh, right. that's good. Right. Um, it's slightly too big, actually. Is there a way of reducing the size of that? Uh, can I get rid of the thing at the top, maybe? Um, um, well, it, it, yeah, that is... Um, I had this problem at the weekend. We can't yeah. see the thing at the top, but it's... Oh, OK, it that's all right. ...top of your... That's OK. Your, yes. That's absolutely fine. OK, so thanks for inviting me. Uh, and what I'm going to talk about tonight is quasars. They're the most luminous objects in the universe, um, how they relate to black holes and what this means for the future of the Milky Way. 
Um, and this image here actually is the first quasar to be discovered 60 years ago, so 60 year anniversary of the discovery of quasars, this 3C273. Um, and as you can perhaps tell from this, the CCD image is actually saturated because the object's so bright. So quasars are extremely luminous and we think they relate to galaxy evolution. So if we start with galaxies, it's a bit of background in case you don't know. When we look up on a dark night, we can see this dusky band crossing the sky if we're in a dark site. Um, and what we're seeing here with our eyes, which are sensitive to radiation with a wavelength of about 500 nanometers, is the thermal radiation of the stars in our own galaxy, the Milky Way. There are about 100 billion stars in the Milky Way. And so the Milky Way is comprised of all these stars. And, and we're in the plane of the disk. And that's why we get this elongated structure. Now, if we look out of the Milky Way, we can see a plethora of other galaxies. And they come in all shapes, sorts of shapes and sizes. And we can classify them according to this Hubble tuning fork diagram, which was developed by Edwin Hubble in the 1920s. And on the left, we have elliptical galaxies. Uh, these uh, are sort of round, slightly boring uh, in appearance. Um, and on the tines of the tuning fork, we have spiral galaxies at the top. Uh, they have these beautiful spiral shapes. And we have barred spirals with a bar in the middle um, at the bottom. So this is the way we classify galaxies. And all of these galaxies, they have about 100 billion stars in them. And we believe there are about 100 billion galaxies in the visible universe. So we have to get used to these very large numbers. Now, if we could fly outside our own Milky Way, it would look a bit like this one here, this SBB galaxy. It's a bar galaxy. And we be about a third of the way out. So this is one way of studying galaxies, taking images and studying their structure. And the reason we classify them in this way is to try and understand how they formed and evolved. So the question's about, you know, is there an evolutionary relationship between these galaxies? So do ellipticals, for example, evolve into spirals or vice versa? So we're interested in the evolution of galaxies. Um, but just looking at the structures, there's only one way to study galaxies. Uh, another very important way is with spectroscopy. So what we do in spectroscopy is that we put the light from our galaxy and star through some kind of element like a diffraction grating or prism, and it splits up the wavelengths of light. So we get this rainbow. Um, the rainbow, the different colors correspond to different wavelengths of light. So blue is short wavelengths and red is long wavelengths. Uh, and what we can do is we can look at the spectra of different types of objects and substances. Um, and as well as the uh, colors of the rainbow, what we see is sharp features in the spectra, depending on what we're looking at. And these sharp features arise from electrons jumping between energy levels in atoms. Um, and the thing is that different, different types of atoms like hydrogen, helium, oxygen, neon, et cetera, they have different energy levels and Therefore, they give different patterns of these sharp features in the spectra. And so each atom, each type of atom, each element has a, a particular fingerprint of sharp features in the spectra. Um, and so we can look at a, a galaxy, you know, halfway across the nuclear, uh, the, across the universe, and we can recognize the patterns of the sharp features. And we can say that galaxy has got hydrogen, helium, just the same uh, elements that we're made of. Um, so it's really remarkable that we can look a long way away and identify these elements. So that's one purpose of spectroscopy to look at the different abundances of elements. But the other thing we can do is, is work out how fast things are moving. So um, this is a Doppler effect. Uh, you'll be familiar with the Doppler effect from sound waves. So when an ambulance is passing us, it's pitch the, 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 the siren of the ambulance, its pitch will change as it's coming towards us, the pitch will get higher. And as it's going away from us, it gets lower. And that's due to the changing wavelength of the sound waves. Um, and there's an analogous effect for light waves. So if an object is moving away from us uh, as, we're, as it's emitting the light, then the wave gets stretched out. That's a longer wavelength. That means redder light. So any sharp features due to elements in our spectra will be shifted to the red. If it's moving towards us, the wave gets scrunched up, we get a shorter wavelength, and the features shifted to the blue. And we can actually use this to measure 
the the velocity of an object and this is the main way we measure the velocities and how fast things are moving in astronomy sometimes though we, if we look towards the center of a galaxy we have may have some clouds moving towards us and some away from us so we simultaneously have a blue and a red shift and what happens then is that the line gets stretched out and broadened so we see very broad lines that's a, a sign of high velocities and it was actually using spectroscopy as a technique uh, that led to the discovery of nuclear activity in galaxies. So back in the Second World War, in about 1943, Carl Seifert, an American astronomer, uh, studied the nuclear spectra of some nearby galaxies. Now, these were galaxies that had very bright nuclei. So if you take a short exposure image, like the top one here, uh, you just see a point like uh, stellar source in the center. And it's only when you do a long exposure, you can see the underlying spiral galaxy. So CIFA galaxies have nuclei that are about as bright as the 100 billion stars in the disk of the galaxies. So they're extremely bright sources. Um, but the key thing that CIFA did was to take spectra of CIFA galaxies. So on the right here, you can see scans of the spectra. So wavelength along the x-axis and intensity on the y-axis. And what you could see in the spectra were sharp features. Uh, that corresponded to different elements. Um, but the elements were highly ionized. The electrons have been stripped off of many of these elements. So we have doubly ionized oxygen, uh, iron that's been ionized six times, so very highly ionized atoms and elements that were seen in the spectra of the CIFA galaxies. But the other thing you notice here is that some of the, the features are actually quite broad. So they're quite broad. They cover a lot of wavelength, so that, like this feature here. Uh, and that means that the gas in the central region of these galaxies is moving very fast. We can see that from the Doppler effect. And in fact, the velocities can be up to um, several thousand kilometers a second. And that's much greater than the escape velocity uh, from the central regions of the galaxies. So we're looking at a really extreme phenomenon here with um, gas being ejected potentially from the central regions of these galaxies. Uh, so these are all optical observations. So this is the sort of wavelengths of light that we can see with our eyes. Um, but of course, that's not they, these are not the only wavelengths we can see. So if we look at the electromagnetic spectrum, this shows all the wavelengths that we can possibly detect from very short wavelengths, X-rays, through UV, optical, that they're the wavelengths that we can see with our eyes, infrared, submillimeter, and radio. Um, and so if we look in the optical, we're only looking at a tiny fraction of the whole electromagnetic spectrum. Um, and the, part of the reason for this is that the atmosphere is only transparent in certain windows. So what the y-axis here shows is how much of the light is absorbed. So over much, most of the spectrum, a lot of the light's absorbed, most of the light's absorbed. So we can't really see x-rays from the ground, for example. But the optical's a window. The light comes through in the optical. There's some windows in the infrared. And of course, the other big window is, is the radio. Um, and it was radio observations that showed the, the next signs after Seifert of nuclear activity and activity in galaxies. And of course, as you're probably familiar with, uh, the early work in this field was done by Carl Jansky. Now, Jansky was a radio engineer working for Bell Telephone Laboratories in the US. Um, and he was tasked with investigating the sources of cosmic radio noise because the Bell Labs were interested in transatlantic radio communication and they wanted to understand the sources of noise. Uh, so he was tasked with looking into that. And he had this rotating antenna uh, and he scanned the skies with it. And what he noticed was, as well as the sort of noise you get from things like thunderstorms, that there was a component that was periodic. So this antenna here rotates once every 20 minutes. And when he examined the uh, the chart of the intensity of the, uh, the signal he was receiving with this antenna, he saw peaks every 20 minutes. And he identified this signal as coming from the Milky Way. So you've got maxima every time the antenna, the beam of the antenna crossed the Milky Way. And and the biggest concentration was at the center of the Milky Way. So this was a, a fundamental step in astrophysics because we detected radiation outside the optical uh, from the cosmos. And what's more, it was from the Milky Way. 
Jansky, though, didn't really have a fantastic resolution with his antenna system. So really, to, to look at the details, higher resolution was required. And so a little later, uh, Grota Raber, uh, uh, a radio engineer and amateur astronomer, um, built this impressive 32-foot dish in his backyard, actually. Uh, and he scanned the skies with it, and he examined the Milky Way and that sort of thing. He was working at a slightly shorter wavelength than Raber, two meters. Uh, Carl, sorry, Carl Jansky was work, working at 40 meters. Raber was working at two meters, so a slightly shorter wavelength. And anyway, this give, gave him a better resolution. He was able to look at the details and map the Milky Way. So he could show that the radio mission did indeed follow the distribution of stars in the Milky Way. Um, and the other thing that was realized both by Raber and uh, Jansky was that the signal was too high uh, to be from stars like the sun, because by uh, even by 1940, um, the, the sun hadn't been clearly detected in radio waves. So and, and, you know, the sun's really nearby. So that means that it's not very luminous in the radio. And if you add together all the stars in the Milky Way, it wouldn't be enough to give you this radio emission. So it really seemed that this was something else other than just stellar emission. The other thing he noticed was that there were some concentrations, one in Cassi Cassiopeia, that we now call Cassiopeia A, another in Cygnus A. So as well as the sort of diffuse emission, uh, uh, you know, there were some concentrations of radio emission in the Milky Way. So this radiation isn't the thermal radiation of stars. What is it? Well, we now believe that it's synchrotron radiation. Uh, so if you look at a modern map of the Milky Way, you can see the plane of the Milky Way. We can see other features as well. So it, 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 it follows the distribution of stars quite well, but there are other features that are outside the plane of the Milky Way that don't follow the stars. Um, and from various evidence to do with polarization, the, the spectral distribution of radiation, that sort of thing, we now believe that this radiation is synchrotron radiation. And so the mechanism here is that we have relativistic electrons and they're spiraling in a magnetic field. And because they're being acceleration, accelerated, because they're being forced to turn around this corkscrew pattern, they radiate photons. And for the sort of magnetic fields we have in space, that radiation comes out in the radio. And these electrons are moving extremely fast. They're relativistic, moving at a high fraction, 99.99% the speed of light. So what this is showing is that, is that it, it's the Milky Way is filled with these electrons moving extremely rapidly, and that's what gives us the radio emission. Um, now, a little later than that, it became possible using variability to actually look at how big some of these radio sources were. So uh, James Hay, uh, a British um, engineer, uh, in 1946, by 1946, had measured the uh, the sizes or the compactness of those concentrations in Cygnus and Cassiopeia. And what he found is that they were quite compact. They were smaller than degrees. So they were discrete sources of radio noise. Um, and then, of course, the question was, what are these discrete sources? Are they stars? Are they galaxies? The problem is that the only way you can really get the answer to that is to get observations at other wavelengths, and in particular, at optical wavelengths, the sort of wavelengths we can see with our eyes. Because if we can get a spectrum and we can measure other properties at optical wavelengths, then we can work out the distance, find out how luminous these sources are, and work out their nature. Um, the big problem was, though, that the resolution of the telescopes at that time was relatively poor. So Hay was able to show the sources were quite compact, but the resolution was poor. So if we look at the field of Cygnus A, so this is the field of Cygnus A, that's the brightest uh, radio source in the constellation of Cygnus, then even with modern single dish telescopes, we have a poor resolution, a relatively poor resolution. So this circle here represents the beam of the Lovell telescope, the uh, Jodrell Bank, 75 meter, one of the biggest uh, single radio dishes in the world. And even with the modern technology, we have relatively modern technology and a telescope of that size working at 21 centimeters. This is the beam of the telescope. And we so we therefore have a problem that there are very many sources within that beam that could be, could be giving us the radio emission. 
And so, um, you know, it was quite a challenge to understand the nature of these discrete sources of radio emission. Um, and so uh, to start with, people called them radio stars. Uh, and to, but to work out their true nature, we needed higher resolution. And so we needed new techniques. Um, and the problem is that the resolution of a telescope uh, is given by the ratio of the wavelength of the radiation divided by the diameter of the telescope is this delta delta theta here and the smaller this number is the higher the resolution so we want a high resolution and we want to get this number as small as possible the trouble is that radio wavelengths the the wavelength is more than a hundred thousand times longer than that at optical wavelengths so if we wanted to get the equivalent resolution, spatial resolution, and resolve details, we'd need to make our telescope 100,000 times larger. Um, so it's a real problem. Um, so if you take the 76-meter level telescope at Jodrell Bank at 21 centimeters, its resolution's about uh, 600 arc seconds. For comparison, the human eye actually has a much better resolution of 17 arc seconds. And a typical optical telescope has a resolution of one arc second compared with the moon's diameter, which is about 1800 arc seconds. So you can see that with single dishes, it's a real problem to get enough resolution to be able to determine the nature of the discrete radio sources. Uh, but there is a technique we, we can use that gets over this problem. And this is interferometry. And what we do with interferometry is that we combine the signals of several different radio telescopes. Uh, we correlate their, their signals. Um, and, you know, the sort of interference we get from that, the sort of uh, interference pattern allows us to get a much higher resolution than we would with a single dish. So the, the, the key thing about this technique is that the resolution of such an interferometer, as we call it, is set by the spacing between the antennae rather than the diameters of the antennae themselves. So by separating the antennae by large distances, many kilometers of kilometers up to tens of thousands of kilometers, we can get a high resolution and get images and resolution that's comparable with the optical or even much better. Um, and the first attempt to do this was made by the group in Sydney um, in 1949. So using radio technology, uh, radar technology left over from the Second World War, they observed sources that were rising over the sea. Um, so they had their detector, their, their receiver on a cliff uh, just outside Sydney, and they observed sources that were rising over the sea. And the thing is that when you look at the source in that way, you get the direct light from the source, but you also get the reflected light off the sea. And so this is like two antennae. It's a very clever technique because it's like using two antennae. You've got one here and you've got the reflection. That's the other antenna. And it gives you a baseline and you can see uh, an interference pattern. And that interference pattern allows you to pinpoint the position of the radio source on the sky. And so they've got much more precise positions and they were able to identify radio sources with galaxies, two galaxies, tentatively. So this is one of them, Centaurus A. So what you see here is an optical image with the this sort of jet structure. Here. That's the radio image superimposed. Um, but it wasn't really a clincher for the detection of radio emission from galaxies, because this particular source, Centaurus A, is a very peculiar galaxy, this nebulosity. And Bolton and collaborators who did these observations thought that it might actually be a nebula within the Milky Way. Uh, they thought it could be an ex, you know, an external galaxy, but potentially it could be something in the Milky Way. And we have this beautiful modern radio map of Centaurus A here. So it's a combination of radio and pink here, an optical image of the telescopes in front here. And Centaurus A is remarkable because it covers a, a huge um, size on the sky. It's eight degrees across, so that's 16 times the diameter of the full moon. Um, but anyway, this is potentially the first detection of a radio source um, uh, with a galaxy outside the Milky Way. But there was some ambiguity because it wasn't clear that the galaxies were really outside the Milky Way. 
The really definitive uh, detection of a radio galaxy was made by Bader and Minkowski in 1954. They used an uh, interferometer position provided by the Cambridge Group in the UK. They looked at the optical position and they found a galaxy. And it looks like an elliptical galaxy. They found an elliptical galaxy there. Um, but the real interesting thing about this is that they also took a spectrum. This is their spectrum, this smudge in the middle here of the galaxy. These sort of sharper lines are calibrations, the real spectrums in the middle here. But they were able to identify these sharp features, these emission lines in the spectra, and work out the redshift of the source. And by the standards of the day, the redshift was very large. It was, it was 0 0.05. In velocity, that's 5% the speed of light. And by Hubble's law, that meant the galaxy was very distant. And then they could work out the luminosity. And it turns out that this source, Cygnus A, is about a million times more luminous than the Milky Way at radio wavelengths. So it's an it's an ex really extreme source. And if we look at the modern radio map of Cygnus A, uh, then it's got this double lobe structure, synchrotron radiation. The double lobe structure is much bigger than the optical galaxy, which is just in the middle here. And crucially, the double lobes are connected to the nucleus with these exquisite jets. So it shows that the energy for these lobes, the enormous amount of energy, is coming from the nucleus of the, the, the host galaxy. And, and since this time, many thousands of similar radio sources have been detected. But this was the first one to be, the first uh, radio galaxy to be definitively dete detected. And to put that in context, the most powerful particle accelerator we have on Earth is the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva. You know, it was discovered the big Higgs boson, that sort of thing. The jets in Cygnus A are about um, 10 to the 25 uh, times more powerful than the LHC. So it's a truly incredible, powerful source. Um, so I've talked about interferometry, but another technique you can use to uh, uh, pinpoint the position of radio sources is lunar occultations. So as the moon sweeps across your source, if you're lucky that your source lies in the ecliptic close to where the moon goes, you can actually time your source disappearing behind the moon and that can be used to pinpoint the position. And this was used for a radio source called 3C, third Cambridge catalogue, 273 by Hazard, in 1963, and he was able to pinpoint its position. Um, and the surprising thing here was that instead of a galaxy, he found an object that looked like a star. So it's a star. It's got a bit of a jet coming out, you'll notice here. Um, and so these are what we now call quasi-stellar radio sources, or quasars, as they're abbreviated. So this is the first detection of a quasar. Um, and it looks like a star. The bright bit looks like a star. It's indistinguishable from other stars in the field. So at first it thought it was thought that it might be some kind of star. But then Martin Schmidt took a spectrum of the source and found uh, lines in the spectrum that looked like a CIFA galaxy, these uh, sharp features, quite broad. Um, and he deduced a redshift. And the redshift was equivalent to 16% the speed of light. And so that means it was for its day, it was an enormously distant source. And if you work out its luminosity, it's about 100 times more luminous than the Milky Way at optical wavelengths. So the Milky Way has 100 billion stars in it. This is 100 times that. And since that time, we've detected hundreds of thousands of quasars using various techniques. And so quasars are the most extreme active objects, and they have luminosities between about 10 and 10,000 times all the stars in the Milky Way and um, the most um, luminous objects in the universe. So that was that was 1960s. So by the 1960s, we detected various types of activity in galaxies. We, we detected CFET nuclei, radio galaxies, and these really extreme and luminous quasars. But what they all have in common is that they're extremely luminous. So between one and 10,000 times uh, a galaxy light in terms of luminosity. So a CFET galaxy would be one galaxy's worth of light. And the most extreme quasars 10,000 times. From variability arguments, we know that they're extremely small. So typically less than one light year. That's less than the distance from the sun to the nearest star. They've got large lifetimes, uh, somewhere between a 
you know, one in a hundred million years. They're not a flash in the pan, like a supernova. They actually last for long time scales. And they've got to have the ability to produce these highly collimated jets. And the only way that we think that we can fulfill all these uh, conditions, getting such large luminosities from such small volumes, is by accretion onto supermassive black holes. So this is the link with black holes. Um, what's a black hole? Well, a good way to think about this is in terms of escape velocity. If you throw something up, it will come down. If you throw it a bit fast, it will go higher up before it comes down. If you uh, throw it fast enough, and for the Earth, that's about 11 kilometers a second, it will escape the Earth's gravity. That's the escape velocity. If you take a body, uh, it could be a planet or a star, and you keep its mass, mass fixed, but you shrink it, the escape velocity increases. Okay, so this is the same mass, but we shrunk it. The surface gravity is stronger and the escape velocity is larger. And so as we shrink the object, the escape velocity gets larger. And if we shrink it enough, eventually the escape velocity will be that of the speed of light. And this is where black holes come in, because black, or black holes or objects are so condensed and the surface gravity is so strong that nothing can escape, not even light. Uh, so light is the fastest you can go. So the escape velocity is greater than the speed of light. So that means nothing can escape them. And these are really extreme objects. So for example, if you took all the material in the earth, the rock in, in the earth, you'd have to shrink it to a ball with a radius of about one centimeter. So about the size of a squash ball to make it into a black hole. So they're really extreme objects. And so black holes are objects, uh, from which nothing can escape. So they're, they're black in that sense. They can't shine like sky stars. So you might ask, well, how do they produce all this tremendous luminosity we see in quasars? Um, uh, and I think before I go on to talk about that, I think it's important to make the point that actually black holes are not a modern idea. The idea has been around for a couple of hundred years. So the idea actually came in the 18th century uh, it's first proposed by John Michel, um, English scientist polymath in 1783. The idea was independently proposed by Laplace a little later. But the true mathematical foundation of black holes uh, comes from the solution of Einstein's field equations in general relativity. And that didn't come till the 20th century. But the reason they're able to generate um, so much light is that we can have a tremendous conversion of gravitational energy into heat and light. So to give an analogy, if you have a waterfall, um, water falls over the edge of the waterfall, it's accelerated in the gravity of the Earth, it picks up speed and energy, and when it hits the bottom, that energy is released. So somewhere in this case is heat is, is released as sound waves, but if you were to measure the temperature of the water at the bottom of the water waterfall, it'll be slightly higher than it was at the top. And that's a conversion of gravitational energy into heat and sound waves. Um, with black holes, it's a similar thing that stuff's falling in. It may form a, a disk around the black hole. Uh, and as that material falls onto the disk, there's a tremendous release of gravitational energy. And the, because the material's falling a long way effectively, that process is very efficient and it's about 10 more, 10 times more efficient than nuclear fusion, the thing that makes stars shine. And this is this is what makes quasars and active nuclei so bright. Um, and uh, you know, this is this is how the black holes generate their energy, essentially. But to get quasar-like luminosities, you know, the equivalent of tens to hundreds of light of stars and galaxies, we need supermassive black holes. The black holes have to have a mass greater than about 10 million solar masses to get quasar luminosities. Um, and you may think, well, how do we produce these jets that uh, accelerate the relativistic electrons and produce the radio emission? Well, what we believe happens is that as the gas spirals into the black hole, there's a magnetic field that's threaded through the black hole and a sort of dipole and if the black hole is spinning, then we get this spiral structure to the black hole, to the to the magnetic field, um, and those magnetic field lines are uh, sweeping around very fast at close to the speed of light, 
And if any electrons are in the vicinity of those lines, they will get accelerated outwards as, as highly collimated jets. So we think that the jets are produced by a combination of spin and magnetic field. And I've got this, sorry about the resolution of this movie, but this just shows what's going on. So stuff falls in to an accretion disk. There's a release of gravitational energy that produces all the light. But if we, if we have a, a spinning black hole, we also get these um, exquisite jets coming out as well. Yeah, so that's the idea, that's the theory. Um, but of course, we'd like to get direct evidence for black holes. So, so we should find we should be able to find evidence for black holes in the sense of galaxies if this is the mechanism that's producing quasars and other active galaxies. The problem we face is that uh, if we look at black holes, we can't actually see any direct light from them because nothing can escape directly from black holes. So they're really dark. But there are three ways in which we might hope to detect black holes. One is the heating effect. That, as I've just shown you, as stuff falls in, there's a release of gravitational energy as heat and light. And so the, the gas gets heated up to very high temperatures and we get this efficient production of radiation. Um, and so we might detect a very bright nucleus. And of course, that's what we see as quasars. So that's that's that is a quasar. So, you know, the fact we see quasars is indirect evidence for something like a black hole in the central regions of galaxies. The other thing is that if we get close enough to the black hole, then we might see high velocities because of the high gravity. Uh, you know, anything orbiting around the black hole has to move very fast to not fall in. So if we see very high velocity gas close to the nuclei of galaxies, that's another sign there's a black hole there. And then finally, if we have super high resolution, we might hope to detect black holes by direct imaging. So we might see the silhouette of the black hole against the stuff that's falling in. And all these techniques have, have been used. So looking at high velocities, uh, we expect to see high velocities because of the, you know, the strong gravity of the black hole, as long as we're close enough to the black hole. The trouble is that we actually need to get quite close in to be able to see the, the fast velocities that are induced by the black hole. Um, and this is difficult with optical observations from the ground. And the reason is that the images we get from the ground optical wavelengths are affected by something called seeing, atmospheric seeing. So there's lots of turbulence in the atmosphere that distorts the waves coming in and blurs the images. So this is kind of related to the twinkling of stars you might see when they're low down. It also causes the blurring of images. So what we see here is an image of a star cluster that's imaged from the ground. And that's the sort of best resolution we get with an optical telescope without using any special adaptive optics techniques or anything like that. Um, so we have a problem. We can't really see, you know, it doesn't matter how large our telescope is, we're limited by this seeing effect, which smears everything out. So we face this resolution problem. Um, and of course, this is where the Hubble Space Telescope comes in. It was it was launched 33 years ago. It's above the atmosphere, and therefore it's capable of exquisite high-resolution images because it's outside the atmosphere. And so this is exactly the same field as the one above, imaged with a Hubble Space Telescope. And you can see that the level of detail is much better because we're not affected by seeing. So we get we can see lots of fine detail and we have a very high resolution. So this is just what we need to be able to see the central regions of the galaxies and trying to detect the fast motions that might be induced by a black hole. And so one of the first objects that was looked at for this purpose by the Hubble Space Telescope is M87. So M87 is the um, central galaxy in the Virgo cluster of galaxies, one of the, the closest large cluster of galaxies to the Milky Way. Um, and what you can see is that it, it shows signs of activity. So this is the HST image, high resolution image. You can see this jet coming out and that's the first sign there's activity there. But as well as that, if you make an image in the light of oxygen uh, singly ionized oxygen, and this is this image up here, you can see that there's a disk in the center of this galaxy. And the thing is, if we detect this disk, we can try and measure the velocities of the disk and see whether we see these high speed motions induced by the black hole. And this is just what um, scientists did. So what they did was they put the 
the slit of their spectrograph across the central regions of the galaxy, and they took a spectrum. So wave, this is a spectrum on the right here, wavelength is to the right, so increasing wavelength to the right. And each position along here is a separate pixel up this way. And what they see, they saw is this sharp gradient across the second, uh, the center of the galaxy from blue shift to red shift. And that indicates very fast velocities of, I think, plus or minus 700 kilometers a second. And that allowed them to measure the mass of whatever's in the center of the galaxy. And the mass they obtained was about somewhere between three and seven billion solar masses. Um, and of course, there were stars and gas in there, but the, the total mass they measured was about 30 times greater than can be accounted for by the visible stars and the gas. So this was excellent evidence that there was a black hole in the center of this galaxy. This is M84, it's another nearby galaxy. Again, they put the spectrocast slit across the center. And this shows the uh, spectrum on, on the right here. So as you get close to the nucleus, you get a really large blue shift by several hundred kilometers a second. And then over a relatively short range in distance, so distance is in this direction here, you get a red shift, a very large red shift. It's a blue shift to red shift. So that's like a rotating disc, one side coming towards us, the other side going away. And they were able to use this to measure the mass of the black hole. Again, about a billion solar masses, much larger than they'd expect from the stars and gas in the central regions of the galaxies. And this is this sort of work's been repeated for many galaxies. And we believe that all large galaxies in the local universe that have been looked at in detail with the right techniques show evidence for black holes in their cores. But of course, the one we're most interested in is our own Milky Way. The problem with the Milky Way is that we're in it. We're in the disk of the Milky Way. So if we look towards the galactic center, like this image on the left here, our, our view of the center of the galaxy is obscured by dust, tiny particles of material in the interstellar medium. And we're looking through the plane. So we, we have a large column of those particles towards the galactic center. And that obscures our direct view at optical wavelengths. Fortunately, though, we if we go to infrared wavelengths, infrared wavelengths of light penetrate the dust. They can penetrate the dust. And what we find at the center of the Milky Way, if we do that, is a cluster of stars. And what's been done over the last um, uh, few decades is that scientists have made images at different times at the center of the Milky Way and made a movie. So this is the movie I'm going to play for you now. It's absolutely amazing result. So the centers of the cross, you see the stars close to the center are moving fast, the ones further out much slower. So there's something in there that's perturbing the motions of those stars. And we can actually see orbits of whole stars like this one, and they're orbiting around something, but you can't see anything there. And so that's you know incredible evidence and probably some of the best evidence we have for black holes in the center of galaxies. So this result, was obtained by Reinhold Genzel um, over the last 20 years or so. And the mass of the black hole is about 4 million solar masses in this case, in the center of our Milky Way. And, you know, I think it's one of the uh, science results of the of the uh, 21st century to, 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 to make these incredible measurements required very high resolution observations, special techniques. And for this work, uh, Genzel got a, a share of the Nobel Prize uh, for physics back in 2020. So that's the Milky Way. Um, but as I say, uh, you know, most of these galaxies that have been examined for black holes are just ordinary galaxies. They're not quasars, they're not active. The Milky Way doesn't show signs of strong activity. But if we're going to show that quasars are really few, you know, they're, they're actually energized by black holes, then we need to try and detect black holes directly in quasars. The problem with that, though, is that quasars are so bright. They're incredibly bright, so we're kind of dazzled by the brightness, and it's very difficult to see the underlying galaxy and the gas close to the center because we, you know, because of all the direct light from the quasar. Fortunately, in some cases, the quasar direct light is blocked off. And in fact, Cygnus A, this is one of the first radio galaxies to be discovered, is one such source. So this is a radio image we see these giant radio lobes again. The nucleus is in the center here. But if we look at it at optical wavelengths, 
we see that there's a little disk in the center and we might use that to measure the mass of the black hole because what's going on this is this is high resolution hubble space telescope images of the center of cygnus a is that there's lots of dust obscuration in the center and so the direct light of the quasars being blocked off so it's a bit like the milky way why we can't see the center of the milky way all this dust is blocking off the direct light um so that's good because we're not dazzled by the quasar light and there's a little disc here in the center that we can use to um to try and measure the mass of the black hole and we know there's a quasar there because when we take an image of cygnus at infrared wavelengths where the light penetrates all this dust then it looks like a point source it looks like a quasar so we believe there's a quasar there but it's hidden by the dust at optical wavelengths so what we did about 20 years ago is that we were fortunate to get time on a Hubble Space Telescope to measure the velocities of this gas. And we measured along these slip positions, the velocities across that central disk. We find blue shifts on one side, that's the side of the disk coming towards us, some red shifts on the other. We plotted the results as a function of distance, and we found very large velocities, and we could work out the mass of the black hole and it turns out to be about 2.5 billion solar masses. So there's direct evidence in this source which harbors a quasar for a supermassive black hole, as we might expect. Right, so that was using velocities to find black holes. But the other thing we can do is direct imaging. But this is incredibly challenging. To actually directly image a black hole is, is very difficult. And that's because black holes are so compact, even if they're massive. So to directly image black holes, we need a resolution that's about 3,000 times better than even the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, it's very challenging. But this can be done using radio techniques. So instead of just having uh, antennae separated by tens of kilometers or hundreds of kilometers, we can actually separate them by thousands of, of kilometers and then in fact across the whole surface of the earth so there's various antennae that we can use on the south pole in chile and um, greenland etc cetera, etc cetera. so we can have a, a telescope that's the size of the whole earth tens of thousands of kilometers a second um sorry so in terms of resolution the d is now sorry i'm going the wrong way the D is now um, the size of the Earth. So we've got a telescope the size of the Earth. And what's more, um, this experiment, the Event Horizon Telescope, uh, used a relatively short wavelength. So it's 1.3 millimeters. So you could say it's the short wavelength then of the radio. So very, very short uh, wavelengths by radio standards. So the, it's not just that the D was large, the lambda was small, and that allowed a very high resolution. Is an effort by 200 people, five petabytes of data. It took two years. And the object they looked at was M87, the one in which a black hole was detected with the Hubble Space Telescope. And this is the image they obtained. So this, I think, is the highest resolution image that has ever been taken in the cosmos. It's got a resolution of uh, a few uh, micro art seconds. And this is the silhouette of the black hole. So the black hole is where this dark thing is here. And we don't see the, the black holes radiating directly. It can't radiate. What we're seeing is the material falling in around it and the black hole silhouetted against that. Um, and so this is an incredible image and it is the most direct evidence we have for black holes in the cosmos. And the technology of it is incredible. Um, okay, so um, I've, you know, I've, I've talked about quasars. I've talked about how that energy can produce, be produced by accretion onto black holes and how we detect um, the black holes using various techniques. Now, most of the black holes we've detected are in galaxies like the Milky Way. They're, they're not active. They're not, uh, they're not quasars. Um, and uh, there's a question about why are only some galaxies quasars? Why aren't all galaxies quasars? Why are only some of them quasars? Quasars are extremely rare, a tiny fraction of the overall galaxy population. Well, what we believe this is due to is accretion, that we only see uh, activity, we only see the quasar if we accrete sufficient material. The amount of luminosity that's produced by accretion is proportional to the rate at which mass is being accreted 
by the black hole. So we think that in most cases, like like the Milky Way, not much stuff is going in. And so therefore the Milky Way is quiescent, it's not active. Um, to produce a quasar though, you need to accrete um, a large rate of material onto the black hole. A large rate of mass needs to be accreted by the black hole. It's about one solar mass per year. And that's actually quite difficult because to get into the central region of the galaxy, it has to lose a lot of angular momentum. And it's very difficult to get sufficient material in the center of the Milky Way to uh, fuel the black hole and see a quasar. So what? how do we actually trigger quasars and fuel them? Um, well, a very promising uh, um, mechanism is galaxy mergers. So when two galaxies collide together, you get radial gas flows and that can fuel the activity. So this is an example, beautiful HST imaging of the antennae system where you have two galaxies merging together, the nucleus of the combined systems in here. And so that's the center and you get these tidal tails thrown off. And so it's a, it's a real smash up. Um, and we believe that such smash ups can trigger quasars. And we have this beautiful numerical simulation from almost 20 years ago now of two spiral galaxies colliding, which shows what's going on in these collisions. So this is just the gas in the two galaxies. They come together, there's an initial collision, then they draw apart. But the thing to notice, well, first of all, the time scale, this is millions, hundreds of millions of years this is taking place over. But what you see is that the gas is moving radially towards the nuclei of the two galaxy. That triggers star formation, it also triggers the, the quasars and the active nuclei. And because of all the radiation and energy produced, you get outflows. You can see gas flowing out as a result of the triggering of the AGN. And so that's a really important effect of quasars to drive all the gas out of galaxies in the merger. And then the two black holes merge together and you get a final kind of explosion and all the remaining gas is driven out of the galaxy. Um, and we think this is how um, quasars are triggered. But the thing to notice about that is the impact it has on the coast, host galaxy can really affect the evolution of the host galaxy. Uh, so what's the evidence for this? Well, Hubble has imaged lots of quasars. And we do indeed see kind of the distorted tidal features in some quasars using Hubble um, that we'd expect of galaxy mergers. Uh, so you can see this tidal tail in this case here. The problem is that the quasar nucleus is bright. The other thing is that with Hubble, because it's got such high resolution, the light is spread out across the detector and diffuse features can be difficult to detect with, with, with Hubble. So while some objects like this with Hubble show tidal features, others uh, haven't shown tidal features. And there's a bit of ambiguity based on Hubble results about whether quasars are really triggered in mergers. Um, so to get around these problems, one of the projects we've been doing in Sheffield is to image um, a large sample of nearby quasars. These are type two quasars. These are objects like Cygnus A where the direct light is obscured by dust. We know from other reasons that they're quasars, but the direct light is blocked off. Um, and we, we, we've got really deep imaging observations and we find that a very high proportion of them show these tidal features. So some of them got double nuclei, some of them show tidal tails, but a very large fraction of the quasars show features that are characteristic of mergers. Um, and in fact, the rate of these features is about three times more than we find in galaxies that aren't active of similar mass as our quasar host galaxy. So we think that this is excellent evidence that the dominant trigger for quasars is galaxy mergers. Um, so for the last part of my talk, I've, I've nearly finished, is, is talking about the Milky Way. So there's this beautiful picture of the Milky Way. It looks beautiful, uh, kind of quiescent in this image. Uh, the question is, why isn't it a quasar? It's got a black hole, 4 million solar mass black hole in the center, got lots of dust and gas we can see here. And what I'm often asked is why isn't the gas and dust just sucked in by the black hole? So why don't we see a quasar in the Milky Way? Well, the answer of course is that um, the gas is actually moving on circular orbits. So just like the uh, earth is going around the sun and it's moving fast enough in its circular orbit to stop from falling in to the sun, the gas in the Milky Way is moving on circular orbits 
and is avoiding falling into the black hole because the gas is moving fast enough. And unless something perturbs that gas, it will just sit there and it won't fall in to the center of the Milky Way. So, um, you know, you might think on that basis that you know, the Milky Way would never be a quasar. Um, but nearby, we have the Andromeda Nebula. It's about two million light years away. And this is the largest close, uh, largest massive galaxy to the Milky Way. It's about the same size or mass, slightly larger than the Milky Way. And the key thing about Andromeda is that it's coming towards us at about 200 kilometers a second. And Hubble Space Telescope observation shows it's coming almost directly towards us, and it will merge with the Milky Way in about 5 billion years. So here's a simulation of what we think is going to happen in the future with the Milky Way. And, whoops, press the wrong button. And the, the scale at the bottom here is billions of years, so we're talking about very long time scales. So this is the Milky Way happily rotating away. We're about a third of the way out. And... Yeah, it looks fine. Nothing, nothing much going on. But then enter stage right. We have Andromeda coming directly towards us. And as time goes on, it gets closer and closer. And eventually it merges with the Milky Way, as we're going to see now. There's a first pass. Everything gets smashed up, so you destroy the disks of the galaxies. And then the nuclei come together and eventually the systems merge. And what we end up with actually is an elliptical galaxy. Um, and so this is what we think we have in store for the future of the Milky Way. And so that's one view. Uh, there's also a mock-up of what it would look like from Earth. So this is the Milky Way. And Andromeda's this little speck over here. It's actually quite close in projection to the plane of the Milky Way. So this is what we see in an image. We set the simulation going. Whoops, sorry. Uh, Andromeda gradually gets closer. And eventually it collides with the Milky Way. Everything gets messed up. Um, and we eventually find ourselves on the outskirts of a large elliptical galaxy. So that's what we, we think we have in store for the future. And of course, when that happens, because of the radial gas motions, gas being concentrated close to the supermassive black hole in the remnant, we expect that somewhere along the line, a quasar to be triggered. And when that quasar is triggered, it will drive all the remaining gas out and that means that star formation will cease in the Milky Way. So you could say that in terms of star formation, it's the death of the Milky Way. Um, so I'm going to end where I started with the Hubble tuning fork diagram. This is the, how we classify galaxies. And what we're trying to do is understand the evolution of galaxies. And one thing I think we've learned over the last 20, 30 years is that one thing that's going on is this, that spiral galaxies merge together across cosmic time and end up as elliptical galaxies because their disks are destroyed. And quasars are a key element in that evolution because as part of the merger, the quasars triggered and the tremendous power of the quasar, uh, its jets, its radiation, all that energy drives the remaining gas out and heats it up and switches off star formation. So that's what we think is happening. And that's one thing we've learned about the evolution on the Hubble tuning fork diagram. So just to conclude, radio observations, I think, have played a key role in the discovery of quasars. But more recently, the techniques developed at radio wavelengths have been used to provide the best evidence, direct imaging of supermassive black holes. We believe that they're, they're triggered when galaxies merge and large masses of gas are driven to the centers of the, of the galaxies and are accreted by the, the supermassive black holes. And we've now found convincing evidence from velocities and from direct imaging that most large galaxies contain supermassive black holes. But most of the time, they're quiescent. They're not accreting enough material, so they don't appear as quasars. Um, but when the quasars are, are triggered, the outflow is driven by those quasars, 
will heat the gas, eject it, and prevent stars from forming. From forming. So we believe that a quasar will be part of the future of the Milky Way when it merges with Andromeda. And quasars in general are very important in galaxy evolution. That's it. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Clive. I just love these uh, those uh, animations at the at the end of your presentation, at the end of time. Um, yeah, absolutely brilliant. Um, um, we've got time for some questions. If anybody's got a question, you can unmute and um, and ask your question. Well, I'll have a question, then, if it's all going quiet. Um, was the simulation of the Andromeda galaxy merging with the Milky Way just the gas, or was it the whole stars, gas, everything? Yeah, so the last one I showed, uh, so the first one I showed was just the gas, um, the, the, the Di Matteo one, uh, the two spiral galaxies coming together. That was just gas. But the last two I showed, or the, yeah, the penultimate one was just the stars, actually. That one didn't show gas, that just showed the stars. Yeah. So that was actually stars puffing off. Well, they get the into star the distance. Yeah. So stars, so if you set off a quasar and you have all these outflows, that doesn't actually affect the stars because um they're too dense stars and you know to be affected by the outflows. But the stars are thrown off due to the dynamics of the interaction. So some stuff falls towards the center, but other stuff is thrown out. So mm. what was happening there is the stars are being thrown out of the galaxy. It's nothing to do with the quasar. It's just the dynamics of the interaction and the merger. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, there was this uh, recent uh, study, The I believe it was the uh, uh, nanograv, studies that were that presented uh uh the uh the uh gravitational wave detection of uh perhaps some of these supermassive black holes merging and i was just wondering if uh if you had something to uh to uh to to uh regarding those studies i'm not sure if you're i'm not too familiar i'm not too familiar with that i mean um of course you know we've now detected gravitational waves um and the ones we detect are from merging black holes, but they're the black holes that are merging in that case are tens of solar masses, typically 50 solar masses. Um, and yeah, so that's how those gravitational waves are produced. The the supermassive black holes, when they merge together in a you know in a merger, uh, will also produce gravitational waves, but a different frequency. So I think that they're a much right. lower frequency. And exactly. And, and, and so yeah yeah i, I believe the uh, the detection that this was uh the, the, the study uh, uh focused on was uh timing from uh pulsars ah yeah and so by by looking at the various uh pulsar timing uh, uh time variations mm. uh they could they could then uh synthesize the uh the uh the detection of these gravitational waves and and so that they were perhaps those from uh, again, as you said, the very longer wavelengths, yeah. which are not detectable with the uh, the LIGO type uh, detectors. Yeah so, yeah, so yeah, that's right. And it's a kind of, I think it's difficult to sort of pinpoint one because it's a kind of noise, right, that they detect. Right, 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 right. But yeah, but they, I think that is one of the interpretations of the noise they see that it's, yeah, merging black holes. Maybe not super massive, but, you know, uh, sort of medium mass, I think in that case. Yeah. Um. Yeah, but that's obviously the future. But I think with that, yeah, got... they, they couldn't actually just, they couldn't pinpoint it. I think you need something, is it least that it's going to be good at the um, lower frequency the, gravitational Right, wave. the, the satellite-based, uh, satellite yeah, yeah. uh, very large uh, uh, yeah. uh, sort of uh, angular resolutions. Uh, well, I thought it was a very interesting uh, uh, result uh, and, and, yeah. and, and, yeah. and like utilizing uh, radio astronomy uh, and and the uh, the timing of the uh, of the pulsars in order to uh, uh, assert the uh, detection of these noise. Anyway, I just thought I was just wondering if you had any any comments on that. But uh, not really. I mean, uh, I think I think it's exciting and it shows the the future of working in this field. Maybe, yeah. 
Yeah, well, wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. We've got a question in the chat from Richard. Um, does dark oh. matter, in particular dark matter halos around galaxies, play any part in quasars and quasar formation? Um, in the black holes of quasars themselves, I think no. Uh, but, you know, when we look at the dynamics of a merger uh, between galaxies like Andromeda and the Milky Way, the way that merger happens will depend to some degree on the dark matter distribution in the galaxy. Uh, yeah, because obviously, I mean, at the most basic level, if there was no dark matter there, the galaxies would have a completely different mass and the dynamics of their interaction would be completely different. So in terms of triggering the quasar, I think it would have a big effect. Um, and I, 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 the other way it will have an effect is the formation of the black holes. I haven't talked about how these supermassive black holes are formed, um, but you need to to actually form a massive black hole or galaxy. Indeed, you need to have a dark matter halo there to start with for the gas to fall in and form stars, form black holes, that sort of thing. So, in that sense, dark matter is important because it's the first part of galaxy formation and the formation of black holes. So it's important in that sense. But in terms of direct effects of dark matter uh, locally, I don't think it's important until you have the actual merger itself. Yeah, yeah I have a question myself, actually. Um, early on in your presentation, you were talking about collimated uh, jets. What, uh, yeah. what's, the, what's the mechanism that forms the collimation? Yeah, it's to do. It's uh, so the basic idea is that as material falls into a black hole, um, you form a magnetic field, and it's like a dipole, you know, like a, a sort of dipole shape. Uh, if the black hole's spinning, the black the the field lines become twisted into a spiral shape above the poles of the black hole. Um, and if you remember from your uh, a level physics, maybe <laughs> you get they, and these magnetic field lines are sweeping around at close to the speed of light, and you get a B cross V force. Okay, you know this right hand screw rule, and the electrons are accelerated out this way, um, and that's how you get the collimated jet. So you can think of it as a kind of net. <clears throat> this spiraling magnetic field is like a net, and if electrons or charged particles get caught in it they will be accelerated out at uh, close to the speed of light. And because of the, the physics of it um, and the interaction with the magnetic field, it'd be highly collimated. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. If that, yes. that makes sense. Yeah. Yep. 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 yep, yep. Um, Hello. Can I ask a question about interferometers, please? Yeah, sure. Um, so obviously, first of all, your talk was excellent. Very clear. Thank you. Um, so obviously interferometers give you better resolution, but what's the compromise compared to one huge mirror? It, 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 well, dish, let's say, not mirror. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's fantastic for getting resolution. Right. Um, and obviously the early ones only had two elements and you had a reflection of the sea. And uh, the the thing about that is you can use that to determine quite accurate positions. But, you you know, with just a few antennae, you can't make uh, detailed maps. But of course, what's happened over the years is that people have built up uh, larger and larger uh, interferometers with many dishes. So uh, the VLA in the US has about uh, is it twenty seven dishes in a kind of cross in a in a cross pattern. Uh -huh. uh, you have Alma <clears throat> in, in in Chile. That's uh, you yep. know fifty dishes, and so what that gives you is lots of different directions, lots of different baselines of different lengths and different directions. So you can actually make images, okay, but the images are not like, it's not like taking a snapshot with your digital camera, right? So it's very difficult, different, sorry, from optical uh, imaging, that you're not just taking a snapshot and recording in the pixels. You're doing interferometry. You have to do some, uh, you know, have to do all sorts of maths <clears throat> to get from the interfering signals from all these different antennae to the final image. And the image you get has lots of artifacts in it, which you have to spend a lot of time cleaning. So the fact you don't have a, you know, a filled dish leads to all sorts of artifacts in your image. And you have to use all sorts of clever uh, <clears throat> techniques that are called clean self-calibration and things like this to correct for these artifacts. Um, so that's the downside of it. 
okay. that that you know you can get high resolution but you have to do a lot of processing to get a reasonable map because um, even if you i mean if you even if you look at cygnus a uh this is one of the best radio images we have you see see cygnus now cygnus a is <clears throat> the second brightest radio source in the sky and so it's very bright it's easy to image but you see these ripples here you see ripples in the background even this the image has ripples and they're, they're sort of artifacts and that's partly because you don't have a filled dish uh I see. that's that's yeah. interesting right so, so, so that's the compromise so that's the compromise you, you know <clears> sort of <throat> taking a, just a snapshot with your your camera um okay. so it's very difficult from you know it's it's very very difficult and it's different from optical wavelengths yeah all right thank you very much but by the way as a matter of interest i studied astronomy at sheffield university about 45 years ago ah just before my a bit before my time in the days of david hughes if you oh know. david hughes yeah unfortunately he passed away last year david but he, Sorry, he, yes. was, uh, he was there when i first arrived actually. he was inspirational yeah he was a great lecturer actually yeah <laughs> thank you very much anyway your talk was very good thank you right. thank you martin you have your hand up <laughs> yes i have yes thanks sir and thanks, Scott. That was a fantastic, uh, superb, superb talk. I thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, question for you, though. Um, you, you, the analogy you gave of the waterfall uh, following, converting gravity, gravitational energy into, you said, heat energy in this case. Um, the infill of stars and other matter dropping into a black hole obviously releases lots of energy, but I'm still struggling to understand how that energy actually gets transferred into jets. Uh, the, the process is involved. Yeah, I think the thing is that, um, you, yeah, so the gas it doesn't fall directly in. it Because it's got angular momentum, it tends to form a disk. Okay. And, you know, if it, if it went straight in, you wouldn't get any release of energy. But what tends to happen is it form, forms a disk. And the thing is that the, the gas in the disk is rotating very very quickly. And one way of thinking about it is that the the velocity of that gas changes very rapidly with distance from the, from the black hole. So the stuff close in going very fast, the stuff further out is going more slowly. And there's a kind of friction between each ring of gas in the disk. Uh, they're moving at different velocities and there's a, a kind of viscosity between the different rings, and that's how you that's how you generate um, the heat, you know, in reality, in detail. So that's the optical light, but also the the material falling into the black hole um, that forms this this magnetic field um, that threads through the black hole, and that's the key to forming the jets. And <laughs> that's what I was saying earlier, if the black the black hole has to be spinning as well, so we think that. To see the, we don't see these jets in all quasars. You know, only ten percent of quasars have really powerful jets. But where we see them, we think that the black hole is spinning very rapidly, and this gives us this um, twisty, spiraling magnetic field. And then electrons interacting with that is what gives you the jets, as I said earlier. Um, yeah, sorry. I, I uh, do you have any questions about that? I mean, I, I must admit that's not an aspect I'm. A, great expert on but uh, you know if you have any more questions about about that no no i i, I, I understand what you're saying i was aware of the discs around black holes and things like that they were really, they were spinning yeah. but i wasn't what i couldn't understand was how it actually went from uh basically from the, the, the gravitational energy into actually the jets i was a bit of the, the gap in the middle and you've explained that quite well i understand that thank you well actually the jets are extracting the rotational energy of the black hole that's one way of looking at it yeah, that's it. So it's actually, it's actually an intermediate step, effectively. Yeah. The process. Yeah. yeah. Right. Thank you. That's, yes, that makes lots of sense. Thank you. Great talk. Right. Thanks. Um, oh, Clive, nice to see you again. Oh, hi. Yeah. Um, just a quick question on elliptical galaxies. Can oh, elliptical Callum, yeah. Galaxies... Sorry, I haven't seen you for, for you know, more than 40, 40 years. years or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, we were, we were at university together in St Andrews <laughs> a long time ago for everyone else. Um, just on elliptical galaxies, can, can elliptical galaxies combine to, to form quasars or is that unlikely? Uh, I think it's unlikely because uh, if you just have a, you know, elliptical galaxies 
um, most elliptical galaxies don't they have hot gas in them that we see in the x-rays but they don't have cold gas so if they merge together the hot gas might get heated up but it won't um, fall into the center in the same way that the cold, okay. cold gas you really you really need to have cold gas uh, to fall in it gets heated up when it gets close to the black hole but the hot gas will because it's so hot um, will just disperse uh, on a large scale and it won't fall in uh, and if it gets heated up, it will actually expand. So um, the thing about spiral galaxies uh, is that they've got lots of cold gas and you get these radial gas flows, but elliptical galaxies don't have much cold gas. So, uh, yeah, I don't think it will work work with them. So so that's why we don't see as many quasars as we might do if they were well, created from, qu from spiral galaxies. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that certainly reduces the rate of uh, quasars. I mean, you could you could have a, a probably what happens in some cases is you have a, a merger between a, an elliptical and a spiral that will work because you still got cold gas. But two elliptical galaxies. Um, yeah, I, I don't think that will work too well. Yeah. Uh, good to see you, Callum. <laughs> good to see you. Sorry, I was late joining the uh, the meeting. We had a bit of an aurora going on up in here. In oh, really? Um, yeah. I was, yeah. I had to okay. had to make tea and then was <laughs> joining a bit late. Oh. It's gone cloudy now, so. Oh, okay. And okay. excitement is over for, for yeah. the time. Being. <laughs> good, it's good time for the aurora. I remember we used to watch them in San Andreas. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good times indeed. From the chat, a couple of questions. Um, oh, okay. Andrew, Andrew Thomas is asking, um, what happens to the gas and stars that are ejected? In the merger? Yeah. Um, well, uh, they will probably eventually fall back in. Uh, well, it depends, okay. Um, if you have a quasar event, the gas gets heated up to very high temperatures and the outflows, some of that gas will definitely be ejected and won't fall back in uh, because it's been heated up as well as you know, being pushed out. Um, but the sort of tidal tails you see in mergers that get thrown out, um, if there wasn't a quasar there, they could actually fall back in. And if they fell back in, you could form more stars and you could have renewed star formation in the galaxy. So actually quasars are, are kind of crucial for heating up the gas and truly expelling it from galaxies. Um, so I think the, the hot gas... Uh, the, the the gas that's expelled will go into the intergalactic medium. Uh, it, you know, if you have a powerful quasar, it'd be hot enough and the velocities would be high enough, they'll escape and go into the intergalactic medium. And certainly for a long time, it probably wouldn't, wouldn't fall back in. But if there wasn't a quasar there, the cold gas that you eject in the tidal tails will probably eventually fall back in and you could have more star formation. And final question from Richard in the uh, in, in the chat here. Um, is there an upper bound to these relativistic electrons? And he's thinking of the oh my god particle detected during the 1990s. I it, I I think it just depends on how these things are accelerated. Um, and uh, I think there probably is an upper limit because it depends on, you know, the magnetic fields, the, you know, the types of shocks you have. You, you, you know, when things collide, you get a shock and you have magnetic fields and you get particle acceleration in those shocks. And I think there are limitations on, uh, you know, on the strength of the shocks and on the magnetic fields. And probably that that will mean that you, you can't have an infinite, energy in your cosmic rays these relativistic electrons um but they can get extremely high energy i mean i think they detected a, another very high energy particle recently um that was similar to to that yeah thank you i had one one uh quick question uh are you familiar with the uh fermi bubbles of the uh yeah. of, of, of our milky way galaxy yeah definitely yeah yeah so, so some some people indicate that that might have uh, might have uh, uh, been uh, from a previous uh, uh, active uh, supermassive black hole activity in, in in the center of our galaxy. And I'm just curious if perhaps uh, similar observations have been made of other spiral galaxies that might have 
uh, similar activity in, in uh, projecting jets uh, as these are interpreted to, to have been. Yeah, so the, the Fermi bubbles, so, so they're bubbles that extend out, um, I think, for about five kiloparsecs and above the plane of the Milky Way in the center, and they're detected in gamma rays by the Fermi satellite and also by um, in X-rays as well. And it's a bit controversial, not 100% sure, but the most likely explanation is that there was a phase of activity in the Milky Way a few million years ago, and that ejected this material, this really high energy material. So a few million years ago, it's thought that the Milky Way might have been an active galaxy of sort of seafoot light luminosity, okay? Um, so it's not a quasar, it's a less luminous form of activity, but it's thought that you know, a few million years ago that might have happened in the Milky Way. Um, yeah, uh, other galaxies, i.e. Well, of course, we detect all sorts of activity in other galaxies with jets and CIFA galaxies and this sort of thing. But if you, I think if you look at normal galaxies, I think the problem is that the sensitivity is probably not high enough uh, to get the same sensitivity as we do for the Milky Way. I'm not 100% sure about that. But certainly if you get outside the local group, I think probably um, things are too far away to see so much detail. If you talk about non-active galaxies and past signs of activity, I think that's probably the case, but I'm not 100 percent sure. But you know, it could be a promising area to look at. Yeah. Are there any more questions before we before I close the meeting? No. Um it, it remains for me to say thank you very much, Clive. Um, we are so, as a, as a group of enthusiastic amateurs, we are so pleased when professional academic astronomers take time to explain stuff to us. And, um, and you're no exception. That was fantastic. That was so good. Thank you very much. You get a, a round of applause and a standing ovation from, um, from all of us this evening. Thank you for the time you put in, Clive. And um, we'll get you back at some point in the in the years ahead to uh, update us on developments in your field. OK, well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Right, bye, bye for now. Good night, everybody.